Man, I'm glad that you are here for the conclusion of our series we've called Seasons. We've been in this series. This is the fourth installment now. If you've missed any of them, please catch up online or on iTunes. You can either listen to it or watch it on our website, the videos. Those are available to you. Uh, this whole series is all about um, getting in alignment with God, really. We can't just pray for God to get in step with us. If we want success, favor, and blessing in our life, we don't say, God bless me. What we need to do is say, God, let me get in step with you. Amen, somebody? That's how you get blessings, favor. That's how you get success is by getting in step with God. And so God has, God has a rhythm. He has a pace. And uh, in this series, we've, dis- we've kind of studied a few of those different rhythms, seasons, if you will. Part one and two was a season of harvest and a season of famine. And uh, you're not out of step and out of alignment, out of the will of God just because you experience famine and droughts. All of us experience all these seasons, harvest and famine. It's what we do in the midst of those seasons. How do we stay in step with God in every season? Because even in that drought, even in that famine that you might be experiencing, there is purpose in the middle of it if you stay in step with God. Amen? Last week, we talked about a season of war, which was, um, man, I enjoyed it. Where are all my men at? Can I get a warrior's grunt? Come on. There you are. Come on, guys. So we talked about a season of war and how God, like we are in right now, a season of war. There is spiritual warfare that is happening, and we are fighting mostly meaningless battles, Battles that God has not called us to fight in, yet we get caught fighting these meaningless battles, but we found out that there is a war that's happening. It's a war in the heavenlies. It's against spiritual forces of evil. It's against the principalities of darkness. That's where the war needs to be fought. But today is the other side of that token, which is really important. If you didn't get last week's message, really important that you catch last week's in the context of today's message, you guys. Check it out here. Here's our theme verse. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. This is where we went last week. A time for war. There's a time for that. There is a season of war. And then there's a season, though, for peace. And now these aren't, these aren't seasons that exist you know, separate from one another, what I'd like to submit to you is that these are seasons that coexist, that God has called us to do warfare, that there is a war that needs to be fought and we need to wake up to it. Because if we don't realize the war that is happening, if we don't recognize, understand that, then you can't cooperate with God and be the warrior he's called you to be. Amen. But there's this other side of that token is, yeah, God has called me to be a warrior and fight spiritual battles against heavenly forces of, of evil and to fight for my family and for the gospel and for the kingdom. And, and, and yes, God has called me to fight for everything he's given me to steward against spiritual forces. But on the other side of that token is God has also called you to be a man and woman of peace. That there is, there, we need to learn how to stay in step with God and stay in season, even though we're fighting a war, that we can still have peace in our hearts. So, There's two truths that I need you to kind of get uh, before we get started today, and that is that peace um, cannot be misunderstood for pacifism, and conflict can't be misunderstood as combat. Very important that you realize this, that peace cannot be misunderstood as pacifism, meaning, well, I'm a Christian, and I'm supposed to be peaceful, and wasn't Jesus peaceful, and like it's peace at all costs. I can't get any fights, can't, get, can't raise my voice, can't do any of that. Peace is not pacifism. Neither is con- conflict cannot be misunderstood as combat because, take some notes with me now. Here's your first feeling right here. Conflict is inevitable. You're going to have that in life, but combat is optional. Conflict is inevitable, but combat is optional. So let me kind of... Um, ask this question, where do we lose our peace? Where is it that, 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 cause I mean, we could be in step with God and be in season and be all peace, you know, loving and joyful, get ahead of devotion with God. But then what happens most of the time that takes our peace away? Can I answer the question? All right. I'll answer it. Cause I know some of you are thinking of it. You know what robs us of our peace more than anything? People, people, <laughs> Whether well, people, you know, whether it's short people, people, you know, those short people in your life, those kids taking your peace, or it could be big people, it's just people. You know, you could be having a great morning. You could have had your devotion, could have had your worship. It's fantastic. And then all of a sudden, 
just somebody coming at you the wrong way, you know, saying something the wrong way, sarcastic, undercutting, um, reminding you of something you didn't want to be reminded about or whatever it is, but the people have this ability or, or rather we give them this ability, this power to rob us of our peace. David wrote a psalm, Psalm 120. It's in your notes, but he writes this psalm. This entire psalm is about um, the difficulty he has with people. It's just how people are, are such a big problem. He, uh, psalm 120, verse 6, he actually begins the psalm saying how, how much stress he's under. He's saying, man, I'm in so much distress. These people, what is the matter with them? And he's singing this, by the way. This is a psalm. So he's singing this. Imagine him singing, too long I have lived among those who hate peace. Here I am. Man, God, what's the, what is the deal, God? I'm, I'm in this world. Here I am, a man of peace. But when I speak, they're not for peace. They don't even want peace. They want war. They're out of step, man. They're, they they want to fight me. They want to come at me like that. God is like, have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like David, where you feel like, man, I'm a man of peace. I'm a woman of peace. I want peace, but I live amongst the co-workers who don't want peace, right? Or, or, or you ever feel like, like I live amongst family members who don't want peace, who are always constantly struggling and stirring stuff up. How many of you feel like that, okay? That you can sympathize with David here that, yeah, we were for peace. Like, I want peace, but how in the world, God, are we supposed to walk in it, stay in step with you and have peace when they, don't want, they want war? They want to fight me. They want, they, they, want to, they want conflict. They feed off of it. They, how, God, what am I supposed to do? So one, what I'd like to do today is to kind of share with you God's word, God's principles, because it is possible for everyone else in the, in the world, the people, that it, it is possible for you to have peace even though people around you want war. It is, so even if your spouse never changes, even if, your kids never do what you want them to do when you want them to do it, okay? Even if your boss gets even more demanding, even, even if all that, there is still peace available for you. There is still peace. And what I'm not going to give you today is, is I'm not going to teach you how to resolve the war that's out there. Because let's just, let's just kind of um, make the conclusion today that we're always going to be at war and there's no way you can stop it. That's actually proven, like history proves that we are a people that are constantly at war. Like we, there is an average of four wars happening at all times. Most of them are happening, I'm talking about historically, through our written existence of history, okay? Most of them happen for longer than a year. So we are a people who are constantly at war. So let's just kind of agree that we're never going to resolve the war out there. Let's resolve the war in here. Amen. Let's, let's figure out how, how to have peace in, a, in an unpeaceful, how to stay in step with God, even though they want war out here. So let me give you what I want to give you first in your handout is the progression of conflict. And I love giving you the, pro, the progression of things, because what I hope to do in doing this is, is that you would see where you're at in the progression, that you'd be able to identify like that's, oh, I do, I, I'm there. Because the hope is, if you can identify where you're at, you can, you can stop the progression before it goes too far. And, and if, you, if you allow conflict to continue, to progress, and you keep it, uh, it gets harder and harder to, to turn around. It, the issue, the conflict gets more difficult, more difficult. It digs more roots and more roots. And the problem where it began maybe small, it's gotten way bigger. And now it's, it's a much bigger issue than it needs to be. So I hope that in seeing the progression, what I want you to do is to see where maybe you're at in this progression. So let me show you. Take some notes, you guys. Here's the first step of, of all conflict usually begins like this. It usually begins with distance, where we just distance ourselves. And I'm not talking about physical distance here, because there's, before even you physically distance yourself from that person, you, you distance yourself in your mind, in your thoughts. Like we distance ourselves in our heart, in our attitude, in our belief. We distance ourselves from people far before we distance ourselves geographically. We have a difference of our distance in our attitude with people. That's where conflict starts. And most people, if you don't, if you don't handle it here, which most people do not, it'll always progress. The conflict will progress now to the second stage, which is where we build walls now. 
we'll put up walls around our hearts, around our, around our um, life. Where, where, and we think they're protective mechanisms because I'm not going to allow you to take advantage of me anymore like that. I'm not going to be hurt like that. I'm not going to let anyone abuse me or mistreat me. So I'm just going to put up some walls. And, and it's a protective. This is going to keep me safe from people. I keep them at an arm's distance. I don't, I, don't, I don't get too close to coworkers. I don't get too close to people at church anymore. I don't get too close because uh, this is my protective barrier because, you know, fool me once, you know, shame on you. Fool me twice. And that's, and so some of us go, no, I'm just going to, I know how to handle that. Put up a wall. But what happens is you think you're protecting yourself from abuse and mistreatment coming in. And you may be fraying some of that, but what you're also protecting yourself from is the peace that you need. The peace that you need cannot, cannot, cannot come through that wall either. The community that you need, the love that you need, you're actually putting a protective mechanism that doesn't just keep out abuse. It's, keeping, it's the very thing keeping out peace. And if we don't tear that wall down, if, we don't, if that wall does not come down, then it will get to this place, which is escalation. And you guys know this, right? Where problems, they begin small. Most conflict, okay, most conflict began at its original, you know, was small, but we made it big in our minds, or we escalated the situation. Have you ever been in an argument where, where it started here, but then they said this, and then you went up them and said this, and then you said, and then they said, and then, and then you can't even remember what you're arguing about anymore, but it's like, you're bringing up stuff that was like 20 years ago, and like, you, like now it's like, how do we solve this now? It's, it's, it's escalated out of control that's, that's where we get, and this is, a dangerous, this is a dangerous place to be because when you escalate a conflict or a problem, you, you, you're basically making the problem bigger than it actually is, meaning that you've believed a lie. It's a lie. It's, it's, it's a falsehood, right? It's, it's not really the problem anymore. I made, it, I made it bigger. The problem is bigger in my mind. I've made it bigger in, 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 this, in this situation, which leads to, escalation leads to this thing, which is dangerous, false belief false belief, where I'm believing a lie now. This is so dangerous. And as a pastor, this is, this is where, where I am, am, most of when I even preach and teach is against this right here. Because this is so dangerous because you've actually aligned yourself with Satan's greatest weapon, which is a lie. Where, you, where, where you're now believing things about that person that aren't even true. You're making assumptions and presumptions and you're reading into things and you're all twisted. And you're creating a reality that is not real. You've escalated. You let the conflict progress to a place where it's not even real. It, this is true. This is now where it's become a stronghold. You are bound by the enemy's lies and his tactics. And it, it, why? Because we just let conflict progress. We will even twist facts to suit our story and our narrative. We'll say, oh, this is proof. This is why. This is why you are, and this is why this happened. This is, and it might sound true to you, but it's not real. It's a false belief. And this is why I say you need to handle this progression. And some of you may be at any one of these stages. Some of you got walls up. Maybe that's where you're at. Some of you may be at some escalating where you're, you're starting to magnify things out of the original simple scenario that it began with. Some of you might be here where you are believing falsehoods. If you are here, there's still hope. There is, it's harder now, though. I just want you to know. It is harder now to turn it around once you have believed a falsehood, once there's a stronghold. But in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, you're going to be free and have peace and walk out of here with peace. Amen, somebody? But again, this fault, when we believe these falsehoods, if the truth does not come in and untangle the falsehood and the lies, then it will, it will continue to this next stage, which is hostility. Hostility. And now, now I'm upset, right? Now I'm angry, I'm mad, I'm frustrated. Here's the interesting thing at, about hostility. You need to catch this, you guys, because hostility is not the emotion that I'm feeling toward the other person. Listen, hostility becomes the condition of your soul. Now, now I have, I have. The very person that I was, trying to, I, was try, I was trying to punish by distancing myself from, I'm trying to punish, I'm putting walls up. The very person I'm, I'm doing that to has caused me now to not have peace within myself. It didn't hurt them at all. It actually just hurt me. Here's how I would ask that if you... 
if you're in this place today, if you find yourself already in a, like hostile, here's how you know. Ask yourself this question. How is your soul? Are you at peace in your soul? Are you, is your soul at rest? David had this conflict in one of the other Psalms. He, he said, why are you so disturbed within me, O oh my soul? And then he continues and he said, put soul, put your hope in God. He's having this conflict within himself like he wants to, but his soul is like so hostile that it's, it's, he's saying, you know better, David, you know better, soul. Put your hope in God. And his soul is going, I can't because I hate him. I don't like him. And I want to, and, and, and some of you know what that feeling all too well, that you're, you're, the condition of your heart is not in step with God. You have no peace. You are hostile in your soul. Finally, hostility, hostility leads to this all-out war. And this isn't the season of war, right, against principalities. This is the progression of conflict where I let it get out of control. It shouldn't be war. I shouldn't be fighting that battle, but I've took it there. I've progressed it there because I didn't deal with it properly. I didn't deal with the conflict. Now I'm at war. And some of you, are you ready for this? You're at war with yourself. Some of you are at war with other people. Some of you think you're at war even with, with God. But I believe that this this might be a hard, a hard truth, but you need to hear this today, okay? Listen, if you are not at peace in your soul, then you are not at peace with God. You're not. I mean, that's, a, that's a hard truth to, to understand, which it, it probably, if you're not at peace in your soul, it, it probably indicates that there's something in your life that's not submitted to God. That's what that means. Because at that moment where I had conflict and I, wanted, and, I, and, I, and I was frustrated and I wanted to hate that person or yell at that person, instead of praying for them, instead of being concerned for them, instead of, instead of walking in step with God, at that moment, I was out of step. At that moment, something in my life wasn't submitted to God. And so if, you're, if your soul is not at rest, it's not at peace, then, then something in your life, you're, you're, you're not in alignment with God. You're not at peace with God. I know it's not fun to hear, but it's a reality. That's a reality that we need to, we need to face up to today. And if we don't end fighting the wrong wars, the wrong, the wrong wars are going to end you. Amen, somebody. Are you receiving this today? Are you guys getting this? Okay. You guys got to give me something, okay? Um, okay. You guys just internalizing everything. I know. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 says this. And this is, this is this, like, like the progression. This is where it gets. He says that it can get to a place where we have this bitter spirit, where we let that conflict progress within us. I'm not talking about out there. Yeah, yeah there's going to be wars out there, but, but we let it affect our heart. We let it affect our soul to where we have a bitter spirit. And it's not only bad in and of itself, but it can also poison the lives of other people in your life. So write down these three things really quickly. When you get to this place, it makes us defensive. Where, where you can't receive criticism, feedback anymore. You're just ready for war. You know, ah, 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 oh, no. And you just, you, bah, 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 deflect. you're just deflecting all over the place. You can't receive, you can't grow. You're just ready to fight. You're just ready to fight. You're ready for war and you're defensive. And that's where some of you might be today. Or maybe you're demanding. Where, where you, uh, when you're demanding, you don't, want to know what other people are feeling. You just want other people to do what you're feeling. That's what, that's, that's where some, and lastly, when you're here, you're just destructive. It is destructive with, there is always destruction in war and there's always collateral damage in war. You ever heard that term collateral damage? Hebrews chapter 12 was just talking about that. When you have this bitter spirit, when you have, when you, yeah, you're going to have conflict. It's inevitable. But when I let that conflict infiltrate my soul, I am not at peace in my soul, in my heart. The Bible says that you become bitter in spirit, and it is a poison. It is a toxin. You think you're just mad at that person. You think that you're just mad. But what you don't know is that poison is affecting your other relationships. It's affecting your other lives. There is collateral damage when you're at war with the wrong people. You're fighting the wrong battles. There's collateral, there's collateral damage. So how do we stop the war? I, that's the question. How do we stop the war, Pastor? What, what do we do? You can't always prevent the wars from the outside, but you can always prevent the war on the inside. You can stop the progression. So let me, let me give you this fill-in. Conflict cannot 
progress without your participation. Okay, that whole progression, it needs your cooperation. Conflict cannot progress without your participation. The quality of our lives does not depend on whether or not we have conflicts. It depends, it's determined by how we respond to those conflicts. So, so peace isn't even the absence of conflict. Peace is how you handle the conflict. It's, it's handling the conflict in peaceful means. That's what peace is. First Peter chapter 3 tells us this. He says, finally, all of you, which is, this is to everyone who's a, the church. He's talking to the church. So this is you. He's saying, hey, you, all of you, all of you need to be like-minded. Be sympathetic. Love one another. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil for evil. Don't repay that. Don't, don't, don't repay evil for, for evil. Don't, yeah, they might be for war. Yeah, they're coming at you with sarcasm. Yes, don't, don't you come back to them with war. You stay in step with God. You stay in, on the contrary, repay evil with a blessing. A blessing. But repay that evil. So, so peace instead. Don't, 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 don't go tit for tat. No, 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 no. Don't repay evil for evil. You're called by God to repay evil with a blessing because to this, he says, you were, you were called. Hey, church, you were called by God. Once you used to be like them, once you used to be for war, once you were at war with everyone and even God, but now God has called you out. He has called you to be like-minded and sympathetic and to love one another. He has called you out of those things into his own. So let me say it this way. Look, um, when you come to Jesus, you ought to be different. Should make you, so if you were like me and you were all messed up before you came to Jesus, okay, uh, and then you came to Jesus and you were like, God, I need you, and I give my life to you, and you make him your Lord, but then your life never changed after that, you probably didn't receive Jesus. Because, because after you received, he calls you out from that, and he changes you. Look, hey, Christianity is not a club. Christianity is not a belief system. That's not, we're, not, we're not here to do something, to find something to do on a Sunday. Okay, we're not here to, to improve our lifestyle and our relationships. That might be a byproduct, but that's not why we're here at all. We're here because we have been touched by the creator of the universe. He has changed our lives. Amen, somebody? It's too late now, all right? I'm already done preaching that point. I should have amen me when I was preaching it. To prime you up. On the contrary, <laughs> repay evil with a blessing, he says, because to this, that's why you were called. That's why he touched you. That's why he changed you. You're not for war anymore. He called you out of that. You don't need to repay that way. You're to stay in step with God so that you may inherit this blessing. You must seek peace, he says, and pursue it. There is a process that we must follow in order to walk in peace, all right? There's a progression of conflict, um, so, but there is a process of peace. So let's look at the first step in the process of peace, you guys. Number one is peace must be pursued. Peace must, look, if peace isn't pursued, conflict will progress, okay? If, you don't, if you're not actively pursuing peace in your relationships, pursuing peace at work, pursuing peace, conflict, that progression that we just went through, if you're not pursuing peace, that conflict will progress, you will go from one stage to the next. Psalm 34, 14 says it like this. Depart from evil. Come out from there. I called you out and do good. Seek peace and go after it. Pursue it. All men and women of God are bound by God to pursue peace. And, and if you're not pursuing peace, you're choosing grudge over God. And some of you are doing that today. You are choosing that grudge over walking in step with God. And if, if you want to be a pursuer of peace, I think you got to do two things. These aren't in your notes, but you got to do two things if you want to be a pursuer of peace. First, you have to resolve conflict early. If you want to be a pursuer of peace, resolve conflict early. The, the longer it progresses, the harder it becomes. The more, the more we, we kind of pile on the conflict issues that aren't even really issues. Resolve conflict early if you want to be a pursuer of peace. Secondly, if you want to be a pursuer of peace, practice restraint, especially with your mouth. 
okay? Especially with the words that are coming out of your mouth. James 1.19 says, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to get angry. Self-expression is, is an idol of our time, right? Social media is just express yourself. We feel like we have the right to just express everything that comes to our heart and our mind. No, you don't. Not if you're a child of God. You need to practice restraint. You need to pursue peace. When a relationship is under strain or something's going not the way you like it, you may be tempted to just unload, but if you're a pursuer of peace, you'll hold back. All right? Recognizing that um, a pro- there's a problem and having the courage to face it doesn't give you permission to explode with your accumulated frustrations and your complaints and your disappointments, okay? Pursue peace. You say, okay, but you don't understand, pastor, the people in my life. You don't understand the people I work with. You don't understand my family. You don't understand the situation. Peter kind of did the same thing with, with Jesus. Jesus was talking about relationships and peace, and Peter was like, okay, God, uh, how, can, can, is, there, is there some wiggle room here? Matthew chapter 18, right after Jesus talking about peace and relationships and all that great stuff, he's, Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive him, though? Give me a number, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep a tally. I'm going to keep a record, all right? Is there an amount of times that, that I, can, I get to before I put my fisherman's fist through someone's face? <laughs> tell me, God, tell me. There's got to be, because that's come. And so he's not looking, he's not trying to be a pursuer of peace. What he's looking for is permission for war. That's what he's looking for, all right? And that's what some of you, some of you, some of you do that as well. You, you are, when people, when people overstep, you think that gives you permission now to treat them the way that you've been treating them. It gives you permission now to say the things about them that what you've been saying about them. And that's not what a pursuer of peace does. And that's what Peter was trying to do. Oh, how many times? How many times got, can I, would I forgive my brother when they sin against me? Up to seven times? Can it be seven? How about, is that, is that a good number? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. He's just giving them this big astronomical number. You know, Peter was like seven He's a fisherman. He's like, dang it. <laughs> dang it. All right. Peace, the process of peace, if you want to be in step with God and, and, and be in season. And uh, yeah, there can be war, conflict, and everyone, they're going to be, they're going to be. It's going to be conflict and war out there, but it can be peace in here. How? You have to pursue it. Pursue peace. Number two, you guys, peace must be made. You don't hope for peace. You can't just hope for peace. You got to make peace. You have to make peace. You can't have peace and not make peace with someone. But if you make peace, you'll find peace. I want you to notice it says made. Mate, you have to make this happen. It doesn't just create. You don't just wish it to happen. Okay, you got to settle in your heart. Yeah, they're going to be for war, but I am going to make peace. I am going to make sure I make peace in my own heart because you cannot have peace if you refuse to settle your issues with people. You can't. You cannot have peace with God if you refuse to settle your issues with people. Matthew 5, 9 says, blessed are the peacemakers. For they are the ones who are actually children of God, the people who make peace. Now, let me tell you something, because people misunderstand peace. What, let me tell you what peacemaking is not. Peacemaking, you may want to write these down. These are extra notes, okay? Peacemaking is, is not avoiding or appeasing. That's not peacemaking. Peacemaking is not avoiding or appeasing. It's not so uh, avoiding where you're just like, you know, uh, we're just not going to talk about it. That's how I, ha- that's how I get, have a healthy marriage. I just, we don't talk about it. I just sweep it under the rug. I, you know, just grin and bear it, you know, swallow it down. That's not peace. That's not peacemaking. That's cowardice. That's what that is, okay? That's not how you make peace in your relationships, and that's not going to solve the problem. Neither is appeasing peacemaking. Appeasing is where you always give in, Right? They always get their way. You know, they always win. It's peace at any price. Appeasing is not peacemaking. You know what appeasing is? Appeasing is codependency. That's what that is. And Jesus never, he never ran from a legitimate conflict. Jesus was able to, to handle a conflict, and, but able to still restore the relationship. 
God blesses, he says, peacemakers. Here's how the New New Living Translation says it. God blesses those who work for peace. You got to work at creating and making peace in your life if you want to stay in step with God. James chapter 3.18 says that a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is such a key verse for you to understand about righteousness because he says that if you're going to sow peace, if you're going to make peace, what you are getting in return is you're, you're made right inside of you. You are made right. When you, when you sow peace, you, you, you sow righteousness in your heart, which it flips the other way. The other way it works. Whenever you, whenever you sow righteousness, you reap peace. So if, you ever, if you're lacking peace in any area of your life, what you need to do is just put God's righteousness in the middle of that. Put God's righteous standard in, in your marriage. You lack peace in your marriage, put God's righteous standard in the middle of your marriage, and you will have peace. If you're lacking peace in your finances, put God's righteous standard right in the middle of your finances, and they will be at peace. If you're having you know, stress or lack of peace in your career or any other relation, in any area of your life, you put God's righteous standard in the middle of that and you will have peace. Righteousness makes peace. And when you make peace, it produces righteousness. Amen, you guys? Amen. So peace must be made. Number three, peace must be kept. Peace must be kept. So how do we do that? You know, We're always going to have wars. If we're always going to have wars, how in the world do we keep the peace, you keep the peace through this word, a biblical word called reconciliation. You know, you know what reconciliation means, church? To be reconciled. It's a banking term. To recon- Have you ever reconciled a bank statement? Any accountants in here? People worked in accounting. When you reconcile a bank, a bank statement, um, what you want to do is bring the balance to zero. That's what it means to reconcile, is you bring the balance to zero. So it's not, it's not conflict. It's not re- resolving it. It's not resolution of the conflict. When conflict resolution is where I sit down with you, and this is what I did right, this is what you did right, this is what I did wrong, this is what you did wrong, let's try to do better. That's conflict resolution. But that doesn't, that doesn't always produce peace, does it? it? It doesn't guarantee that you will have peace. Reconciliation says, okay, that issue, that wrong, that problem, that situation, I, bring it, I cancel it, I bring it to zero. You say, what in the world are you saying, Pastor? You're speaking gibberish now. What is going on here? Okay. Look, thank, let, thank God that Jesus did not come to earth to resolve our conflict. Thank God he didn't sit down with me and go, all right, Jason, this is where you're wrong. This is where you're doing all right, but this is where you're messing up. Do this, do this, do this, do this, and then I'll let you into my heaven. Thank God he didn't resolve. The Bible says he came and reconciled us unto himself. That he came and didn't resolve our conflict. He, re- he brought the balance to zero. He said, everything that you've done, yeah, you've been, you've been a knucklehead, dang it. But, but you, here's, here's what we'll do. All that you've done in your past, all that you ever do in the future, I bring the balance to zero. Done. So you could show up. No matter what you did this week, you show up into heaven today, your balance will be zero. I'm not, I'm not talking about a license to sin, okay? That's not what I'm, don't hear me that way, okay? Because all that'll show is that you don't know who he is, okay? I'm talking about grace, that by God's grace, you have been reconciled. This is how peace is going to be kept. In, in a world that we live in that does not know peace or have peace, in a world that is for war, that progresses conflict to war constantly, the only way that you're going to stay in step with God, the only way that you're going to keep peace is not by bringing them to the table and making them see eye to eye with you. No, you're called out. They're never going to see eye to eye with you. You're the chosen. You're the royal priesthood and a holy nation. They'll never come into agreement with you. What you are called to do, though, and what God is said that he's given you is the ministry of reconciliation. You have been given the same ministry that Jesus came and gave us, that he reconciled us unto himself. God says, now I want to give you that ministry. I want you to go and bring zero balances wherever you go. 
Yeah, you let that conflict progress. Yeah, you built up some walls. Yeah, you, you, let it, you let it poison and it makes some bitterness there. What you need to do is let it go. Don't even wait on them. Don't wait for them to see it. Don't wait for them to ask for it. Don't, it doesn't have anything to do with them. Just bring the balance to zero. That's how, that's how it's kept. Peace can only be kept in this world through reconciliation. Let me, let me jump to your fill-in here, the fill-in for here because I'm running out of time again. The, the process of peace, though, and this is important, is a person. The process of peace is a person. Peace is not something that I can honestly create myself, not, not the peace that I need to stay in step with God. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that peace is actually a person, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We, he has called us unto himself, for he himself is our what? He. he. Whenever I find myself out of step with God, when I'm hostile, when, when, when I don't have peace with someone, that's why it shows I'm not at peace with God is because he is peace. And when my soul is not at rest and when I don't have peace, all it's revealing is I'm out of step with God. It's not them. It's not about them. Yeah, they may have hurt you. Yeah, they may have said some things, but it's not about them. You can actually have a peace in the midst of war, in the midst of trial, in the midst of conflict, because he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of what? Hostility. And some of you need that today. Some of you need that hostile wall that, you has, that have, has been accumulated up around your heart. Through varying relationships and challenges and problems, this wall of hostility has just grown in your life. And that wall, in Jesus' name, needs to be torn down by the Prince of Peace. Can we do that together? Can we bow our heads and pray?